the uh, first day was fair, and it's coming up here in just about a couple weeks. And uh, we need dozens upon dozens of volunteers to help us welcome someone in the neighborhood from five to 700 guests from our community. You know, the church, one of our values is so outward to pass it, and we love to do events like this because it's just a holiday for family, and it is a, hopefully a privilege and honor to be a church that exists in this city community. And so if you have any chance to sign up, we would uh, love for you to do so. You can find out more information uh, first step on your way out. Well, today we are embarking on a two-week uh, teaching series that uh, has probably never made me more nervous in, in the entirety of my preaching career, if you will. These two messages I have probably rewritten, solicited, more advice, prayed over, going back to say this week and next week, arguably over anything I, I, I've ever said, because look at your wife. If you know what's really, really easy to do, do not talk about in church? Politics? And it's only just me even saying that word. You kind of tied it up a little bit, right? And that's how you feel. That's how, how, how I feel. You know, when it comes to church, we, we, it's easy to talk about faith in Jesus and his king and lord of our lives. And when it comes to, to politics, there's a, this, this weird dichotomy. It surrounds us and it controls a lot of things in our lives, whether we like it or not. We find ourselves thinking about it, talking about it, sometimes arguing about it. But coming up on this cycle, it's not lost on me that I don't spend a couple of weeks talking about it. Now, the fact that we've been a sad reality, and perhaps you can see this first hand for your own kids, is the division that political views have caused. Maybe it's division uh, with someone in your life, maybe someone in your workplace, maybe you just attended a church at some point in the past that says, if you don't vote in this way, you are not honoring God with your life. I need to tell you, as a church and as a congregation, this is why we're going to talk about it, not because those are things that need to happen, but because it is the reality. The reality is that our church is made of people from all over. Not just all over the EU area, all over the globe. We're filled with both different people from different backgrounds, histories, socioeconomic status, and different countries are, are, are present every single sudden day here. It's also not lost on me that some of you, this is your first season, clinical season, as a disciple of Jesus. And you've been told or thought to believe that all Christians must vote a certain way, or maybe that was the reason you avoided church in the first place. Because whenever Christians and politics got together, it got really ugly. And so here we are. I feel a little nervous. I feel a little anxious. And we're going to talk about it for next few weeks. But before we dive in, before you tune me out, uh, I want to offer up this disclaimer, if you will. Number one is that for the next two weeks, it'll probably make us all a little uneasy. We'll all probably be a little uncomfortable at some point or maybe. Number two, I'll ask you this week and next week to pray. And if you listen gracefully, and you don't listen to judge, if you do hear me out, if you ever find yourself arriving at a spot, and like, is that really what the church thinks or is it? Have a conversation before you uh, arrive at a conclusion. I want to say that I consider it a great privilege and a joy. It is an honor and it is a blessing to live in this country. We have freedoms and liberties that we have as Americans. It's a free gift that not many to the rest of the world get to enjoy. At the same time, too, I need to be giving what I say here is I don't love America more than I love Jesus. I don't love this country more than the king of the universe. And so when my American thoughts or opinions come headlong with my views of who Jesus is, it's those views that submit to Christ like the other one of us. so here's what you're not going to get for the next few weeks. And this is a deafening sign. You can just hear it right now. Okay? This is what you won't get for the next few weeks. You will not get a candidate endorsement. You will not hear me say, if you want to be a follower of Jesus, this then is how you can vote. And go away. You will not get that from me. You will not get any policy suggestions or stances. You won't get any argument fire, any gossip flows, or don't get any type of moments. But here's what I do hope you walk away with this week and next week. It's an answer to the question that I feel, the presentation you feel right now, the kind of thing you right now, is how do I, as a disciple of Jesus, handle myself during a disciple? 
to make sure that we do in history as polarizing time every four years and do so in a way that doesn't perhaps compromise my political opinions, which you are able to have for yourself, but also remain more honored and glorified to Jesus, to love my neighbor as myself, to pick up my cross and to not tamper my witness in the kingdom. That's why I want to finish up and pursue together for the next few weeks. And so uh, one, of, one of our uh, pastors that went to his message said, hey, probably a good idea. Why don't you land the plane up top so you can know where you're going? So here's where we're going. This week and next week, you want to know what is a good idea for this series on politics? And I love how Blaine and I came to the pastor and made it look like a square word because we really want to talk about it. But you put it this way. And this is where I put it. This is where we're headed. It's that if Jesus is Lord, then heaven is our home. And if heaven is our home, it is the gospel that is our only one true hope. Church, if you want to know what I am convicted about this political season and cycle, it is this. It's that the world is stupid. And it's usually this time of the year where everyone's like, no doubt. A little bit more than we would care to admit. And I think this is where we all do a service to this in mind. If you are a follower of Jesus, this is but a blip on your radar. This is not the word for you. John Hebrews chapter 3, verse 14, if you come to share in Christ, if we do hold to our conviction firmly today, goes on to say in John chapter 12, pursue peace with everyone in holiness, because without it, no one will see the Lord. So I'll be the with you for the next two weeks as we kind of talk. Uh, about this thing that we all don't really want to talk about. So let's get it. So I want to start by actually just making us all a little uneasy. Uh, how many of you would agree, Phil, today that when politics comes up, it seems to create some sort of divisive or partisan rhetoric? Sure, how many of you would probably agree to that, right? The majority of us, if not all of us. Because what we are told, or the bill that we are sold, is that if you aren't for one side, you are vehemently against the other, right? If you don't vote this way, then that means you hate this. If you don't cast your, your, your self on your ballot over here, then well, that means you are completely against everything that they stand for. And I find myself oftentimes somewhere in the middle. I find myself somewhere in the middle. Hold on, why does that have to be the case? There are always going to be people on the fringes of the aisle. There are always going to be people on the far out of the street. I believe that the majority of us here at this church is that we have somewhere in the middle. When I say the word middle, I don't mean a moderate political view. I mean someone who says, I have my political views, but I don't want to sacrifice the religion. I have what I believe, I have what I think, I have the way I'm going to vote. But what I don't want to have happen is get at odds or edge with a co worker or a neighbor. I don't want to have to just keep unfriending every single person I see on Facebook for the next three years because of this. If you're anything like me, you find yourself somewhere in the middle. And that's what I want us to kind of think about. How do we, how do we get here in the first place? You know, the, the few researchers that did a recent study, they asked Americans, what are some of your uh, most pressing feelings when it comes to politics? And this is what they came up with. Here's a list right here of the top emotions that feelings when politics are involved. Things like anger, anxiety, apathy, concern, and then my favorite one is flat out exhaustion. Right? So I'm not going to say, hey, raise your hand for which one. But my guess is there is something on this list right here that you would say, yes, when I even hear the word politics, one of these things comes to surface. And, and the research went on to say that the reason this probably happens, even though our leaders and our legislation is vitally important, these aren't the things we want. So, so, so this one, where does it come from? And they, they kind of boil it down to the fact that it's probably due to the sources that we receive our information and the filter in which we go through thinking about these things. So we started with our data for millennials and Gen Z. Millennials and Gen Z, you can get an AL. Your boy goes, all right, for those of you in the room, a study says that the hour, to be uh, an older millennial, our number one story of authoritative, with lots of air quotes, information when it comes to politics is found on social media. 
YouTube phone closed through by Instagram and all of them. And uh, Instagram and TikTok. Now, here's what we know about this. We know that, that these social media accounts are impartial. Thoughtfully curated sources of information that respectfully express views of both sides in a non biased way that is helpful and doesn't cause the right? Am I right? Boomers and Gen X is taking a. a Hey, there you go. You guys are awake this morning. You're not off the hook. You're not off the hook, right? So it goes for, for you guys of that generation. Uh, news media is typically the number one source. Things like Fox or CNN fall very closely by Facebook. Which we know to be impartial, thoughtfully curated sources of information that are respectfully expressing you the whole time in non-biased ways that is helpful and so positive. You see the problem? You see how words like anxiety, anger, exhaustion, might even feel like things like addiction. It's because not only do we have poor sources of information, politics seems to be your source of hope and life. See, the beautiful world that we live in desires to be the functional standard for you. It wants to offer you the hope that you want to find. What you desperately want to cling to, what you pray for, most desperately in this life, you are bound and make the difference. You see, the right and the left, they are not balanced ideals. They are idols. They are idols screaming for your attention. They are idols screaming for your money, your energy, your family. They do it to you. This is how they try to offer you hope. Have you ever said, we got all this kind of people, have you ever heard someone say, if great candidate wins, we're good? If certain candidates get into the office, that's it, this country is over. If the Trump get, gets elected re again, if they're in full sit down, that's it, I'm moving to Canada. You ever heard that? Have you ever heard the opposite? You know, the only way to save this country, the only way for us to get back on track, this country is going to hell in a handbasket, the only way for us to get out of this run is to vote for Bill the Blake. The reason that happens is because political ideals are calling you to leave it up for your one true hope. It says, let me tell you, there is only one person who should be your one true hope. And he is not on the back. That is Jesus saying, let that be. Right? He's not on the back. The kingdom of God is not a political party. And either candidate, get this, is going to back you into some sort of moral dilemma. So my point is this, is if you are going to offer a work that prays admiration and hope for somebody in this life, make sure he is the one who holds eternity in his hands. Because he's Jesus. And what we believe is true about Jesus is that he is already king. And the place that he most wants to sit is not in the Oval Office, but in the throne of his heart. He will not be on the ballot. No one who represents him to a key that will be on the ballot. His kingdom is not a political party, but his kingdom very much is a group of people throughout time in every tribe, tongue, nation, ethnicity, social status, and yes, even political party throughout the world. So I want to read this in today's passage in Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3 says, You had a building with it. We're going to open the Bible today. This is a lot. Right. Of course, we are. So, Philippians chapter 3, uh, we're talking on our series through John, we'll pick it up uh, in, in early January of next year. Uh, Philippians is like, I don't know, 12, 13 steps away through your Bible or something. If you're the back of your Bible, if, uh, if you are turning there, look for the key as all the books that end in I and in uh, Philippians, keep the place as first, second, best, and one of the those of the life. As you're turning there, I want to set the stage because the, the letter of Philippians, is known as the letter of joy, 
despite any circumstance. In four short chapters, the Apostle Paul uses the word joy 16 times. And what's crazy about that is he seemingly has nothing to be joyful about in his life because he is in prison while he's writing. And he's writing to his first church plant in a Roman colony known as Philippi. And Philippi is going to be like uh, the modern day Florida. It's like a retirement place for all of the political people, all the Roman soldiers, when they're done in the big capital city, they will go all the way down to, to Philippi. They have nice weather, they have beaches, uh, they have a the hangout, they played a lot of tennis, a pickleball. It's a great place. And so Paul writes this letter to this church that is blooming and blossoming, that is running headlong, intersecting with this group of people with a mixed pride for their country. And throughout the letter, Paul is writing to encourage these new Christians, saying, remember who is true king of your life. It is something to be considered, something to remember, that that king is Jesus and Jesus alone. And even though you might face persecution, and even though you might have to act a little different, you realize that where your true home is. And so before I wind down this letter, we're going to pick up in the first 15 of chapter 3 this morning. If you're there, stay there. We're going to dive in to Philippians today. Paul then writes this. He says, All of us then who are mature, so do I work with mature? To take such a view, uh, if you want to write a note there, you can write verses 13 and 14 next to such a view of such things. And if on some point you think differently, that too, that will make it clear to you. Only let us live up to what you have already attained. I don't like that word, already attained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. But I've often told you before, and I will now tell you again, even with you, that any of us have the peace of the cross of Christ. Their death is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is their pain. Their mind is death on earthly things. Verse 20. If you are highlighting the person, I don't want to have a person. This is our verse. But our citizenship is in but our citizenship and mature disciples of Jesus is the good of the Eagerly awaited Savior, but then the Lord Jesus, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glory. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you This is what mature disciples look like. He gives us because mature disciples look forward to heaven, not to earthly things. Because all of you who are mature, you need to, to think in such a way. He's referring to verses 13 to 14. He says, I have all of these afflictions. I've been prison, I've been sick, I have all this going on. But I press on towards the goal. And the goal isn't to get out of prison. The goal isn't a political win. The goal isn't a monetary gain. He says, the goal is heaven. In verse 15, he says, so therefore, that's why I live in this manner. Because it's already attained and it's stored up for me because of who Jesus is by grace through faith. Not a work of yourself and certainly not a vote of yourself. This is what I get to cling to as a mature disciple of Jesus. He is unlawfully, wrongfully, most likely imprisoned in Rome. And he never takes a shot at him. He says, oh, by the way, if a Roman soldier comes to your door, you're going to have to if they begin to say something about me, well, here's what you need to do. And yell louder and argue. And this one, blah, 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 blah. There's a certain finger that you want to give to a man. I'll, I'll turn the other way. No, he just simply says, I think you're a good man. I press on the matter what happens. He never suggests how to go 
for a tax break to put another person or group of people who disagree with him. He states, because my focus is on the Christ, because his life is what is lived on the way of God, I do not be proud of him. Can we just stand for a moment? Isn't that what politics seems to do so much of us? And it takes our eyes off Jesus, off things that are husband and wife. We get all words that Almost to the detriment of our spirit to focus on person. Paul says the mature disciple the Holy Spirit for all of us. Because many earthly things are out of your control. So whether that's political outcomes, school boards, executive administrators, a lot of things are out of your control. There are things out of your control, like cancer. The actions of the spouse, other drivers on the road, they are out of your control. And Paul is trying to say, we all move life with blindness. And it's up to you to decide, are you going to choose to look to heaven at all times? Or are you going to look to the left or to the right or in front of you or behind you? Because when you look to heaven, you see hope and life. And what is waiting for you, but everywhere else you look, you are going to see pain and destruction. Because where you are looking is what you will see. You see, the third disciples they look forward to heaven, not earthly. But then the normal says the opposite. The immature disciples look forward to earthly things and not heaven. And then we pick up there in verse 17, and he says, So join together and follow in my example. I'm trying to say, some of you, you've gotten off track a little bit. You need to join in on this. You've been distracted by the worries of this world. And it appears you point out a smattering of things that this world is just chasing after of their own heart. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is their sin. Their mind is set on earthly things. Don't be like them. Be a citizen of heaven, dictated on the cross of Christ. And the, the future that is in store for you. Remember, their destiny is their destruction. That's why it's hateful. That's why it's despicable. That's why it's broken. That's why it's corrupt. But their major issues, they are focused and fixated on their sin. Believe it or not, I want to tell you this is that an earthly election is, in fact, an earthly thing. I'm not saying don't look at the I'm not saying don't ask a vote. I'm not saying don't have an opinion, but please, 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 remember that it is the journey to heaven. And this temporary back and forth that's crazy to me to watch this happen is the kind of both parties want Jesus on their side. You ever notice that? It's not just the leaders of the party, it's the issues that they want to stand for, the issues that they want to put forward. You know, they do could make Jesus look red. You could make Jesus look green. You could make Jesus look green. You could make Jesus look yellow. Look at color, color, but it's not red. But that's the problem. That's the problem. If too many of us are settled in our society with being Jesus to our political filters, and that being the political reality for what it is to win a citizen of heaven. If you want to get on your side and you lean to the left, you're going to emphasize Jesus to fight the dignity of all people. If you want to fight foreigners and the refugees and the refugees himself and his life, the way in which he's called to the sharing of burdens and in fact probably his practices to fight that. If you want Jesus on your side and you lean more to the right, you're probably going to emphasize his commitment to men. To life, to where it begins, to where it ends, to things like financial freedom. Everybody wants Jesus on their side, and yet Jesus doesn't want to fix it. Here's my point is that Jesus is not a doctor. Jesus is not a doctor. He's not a porcupine that's studying the world of the military and can predict the battle. He is the Lamb. He is the Lamb. He's not a 
a political system. You can come and tell my people to stand. And from this is how I will know that you are my disciple by how you love. Really, by the way that you love one another. So as you pick up your cross, come back to me. Love your neighbor as your self. You didn't come to two sides, six sides, three sides. You came to save souls in the world. And there are political rhetoric from the top to do things. The anger, the hostility. And it was a way, it's hard because uh, if you feel the tension that I do, I'm just going to read into this one really carefully, so hear me gratefully. It, it, it's when the issues get brought up, I get very uncomfortable because there's often a line that's drawn and says, which matters more to you? And as, as, as a follower of Jesus, the answer I want to say is that you can accept it. But what is what happens? The political rhetoric is going to put two things against each other. It's going to say, well, which matters more? And they're going to say things like this. Brace yourself, okay? Can you brace yourself? What matters more? The molested mother or the unborn child? What matters more? What matters more? The black life or the blue life? What matters more? The innocent Israeli or the innocent Palestinian? What matters more? That, I, say, I don't see my outcome on the list. As a disciple, as one who believes in the image of God, I feel like I have the audacity and boldness to say, where's the all option? Where's the all option? That everyone is made in the image and likeness of God. Where is that option on the ballot? I don't see it. So therefore, I will not be put in a box. And until that option exists, which I am convinced it will never exist until Jesus returns, there's no place for me to land politically, wholeheartedly, and feel good about it. Because that option is not on the list. And so I implore you, if you claim to be a mature disciple of Jesus, have that same Audacity. Claim that different way that the image of God is out of office because they all matter to people. I'm not giving you to the school of the brother. I'm not doing it. You can hear me. I'm, saying, I'm not saying don't vote. I'm not saying don't have an opinion. If you want to be a single issue voter, by all means, that is okay. But know that Jesus is not a single issue savior. So it would be good for us to remember the disciples that America is not our home. It is our victim. The kingdom of God is not 3.8 million square miles on the western side of the globe. It is a conglomerate of surrounding stars. And what I know to be true is that means that it's dignity for all people, the gravity for all people, and divinity for no people. There is no human that is worthy of my praise and my admiration, especially being considered my one true hope in the Savior of this life. Every human institution, this God of heaven, established in my magnificent and wonderful life, will have selfishness, it will have corruption, it will have brokenness. In a four year span from that, he has been very much as always. That's what it is. Talking to somebody recently, and uh, yeah, you know, what do you think about it? And uh, John said, We're talking about politics. And he's a like, cool, I won't see it for a couple of years. He's smart, he's smart. And he's like, What do you think of it? Because Jesus didn't live in such a divided home as we do. My answer was like, You're right, he did. Yeah, it was what more divided than we do. Like, it was way more divided. He had the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Romans, the pagan worshippers, the zealots, the Jews, the Gentiles, and on and on down the list. It was way worse. And guess what? He never deterred. Because all of those political leaders are gone in place. 
all those political kingdoms are dead and gone. All the ideologies of Jesus the time have not stood the time yet. Jesus and his gospel and his kingdom is still reigning in here today. I hope you can hear my heart in this is that if you are king of the world, if you are savior of the world, he's Lord of our lives, he is more concerned about who sits on the throne of your heart than who sits on the throne of your heart. Because the Republican kingdom will die. At some point in time. The Democratic kingdom will die. At some point in time. America will probably die for us forever. To the kingdom of God. What a long time with this idea of God. To think about, if your candidate is a chief of those, if you're going to win or lose, do you realize that? It's like a chief of the win or lose situation. Right? But they're not like, they're not like, they're not like, they're not like, you know what, let's put it first, let's all come together and let's talk about it. If you choose to vote, you're going to vote, you're going to talk about it, and your candidate is either win or lose. That cross you feel strongly about, like it's passed or not. Your taxes are going to get worse or probably worse. Live it alone. So, but guess what? Guess what we get to do four years from now? Oh, you are so excited to get to do it. Oh, God. Heaven forbid. The world is going to change and change and change and change. So we're going to do it again and again. But a mission very simple. Let me tell you that with a slightly true. I do a practical way. I look at this way. How often should my faithful, mature disciples of Jesus hold over themselves during this time? Look at what the Bible Paul says in Philippians 4 48. He goes on to say this. Has all this in mind, says this, rejoice in the Lord. Always. I will say to get rejoice. Let your, what's this word? Gentleness be evident to all, for the Lord is with you. Let the anxious brother be saved. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and mind in Christ. Jesus. So finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is known, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about this. My Bible doesn't have any asterisks in here, you know, no footnotes or clarifiers that, that say, oh, by the way, though, as long as your pundit gets into office, or as long as the ballot seems to fall your way, you know, he just says, let your gentleness be evident to all. What does all mean? What? All situations. Good, bad, and different, not really sure, apathetic, and bad behavior. Let your gentleness be to all. Well, how do I find gentle to all people? It's just so cool to get under my skin. Are you thinking about what is true? Well, So the idea which comes out when politics are involved is you're prone to calling names or misleading someone because of the way they cast the ballot because you view them as a political enemy. There is something in your heart that you just want to call. You have allowed something other than him to become a functional state and false hope to turn an earthly thing into an eternal thing. But Paul says, we have to be one. Not because we all vote the same, think the same, have the same political preference, but we are united as citizens of heaven, as kids, who by the way, through him, have been redeemed and restored by the blood of Christ Jesus. So 
how can you handle yourself? Because you keep on playing for it. It's perfect. Gentleness and dignity. Before all Before all things. If you're curious about how to be unified and loving and gentle and humble and honor the spirit, probably better to hold your place or not close that spirit. And for you, don't call me one of the names or the candidates. But as people, I doubt my life wants to be more of a male love. For some of you, avoid social media. Not posting on social media is probably going to be a wise decision. Especially for those that most of us are have the wherewithal to know that it's not going to be a continuous way to live through. If you ever hear somebody at the office and their blood pressure starts to rise, they may be blood in the list. Right? Let's see. If someone brings it up to you, you know you're a very like politically loud. I can't. And they tell me, yeah, you know, I'm like, oh, it's good. Yeah, sure, sure, over here. Okay, here we are. Tell me what it How many more are you going to do? Actually, listen to somebody instead of loading your arsenal for a bunch of well activities or fake news and all the way. Memorize this phrase. And I'll figure out how to get it to you. It's a phrase that I used last night, so I don't think it's going to be a good question. It's okay, people. It's okay that we don't stand or change you. Because you, as a person, are more important to me than I am. It's okay that we don't go for things. It's okay that we make a difference in the future. You, as a person, are more important to me. What to get to keep in unity? Gentleness. Love of Christian. The full of natural self is humility and stability with the gentleness. It's not allowed us for your cycle to give us all work to act or anger or spiteful or ugly or harsh. But don't let it temporarily keep up in our hearts and minds to the eternal religion. For if you get through the Lord, Heaven is our home. 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 He